Hi class. This is such a bummer that we have to be doing this this way. I can't believe how crazy the world is. But at least I get to teach you a little bit. Last week, we finished up with Sherlock Bones and the forensic anthropology stuff, the bones stuff. Now we're going to do teeth. I couldn't find anything that I really liked online about the forensic odontology, so I'm going to teach you myself. What you should be doing is, on any regular piece of paper, take notes, and then you're going to upload the photos of those notes to the assignment in Google Classroom. So you can pause the video or whatever you need to as you're going through and rewind or whatever you need to get the notes down. So your grade will be on the thoroughness of the notes that you take. This technology is a little new to me, so here we go. All right, so Forensic Odontology is the title and it is a specially trained dentist that is working with law enforcement on some kind of crimes. So as far as the pictures are concerned, um, the first one would be trying to match a bite mark on a body to someone's tooth impressions that they had from a suspect. And the second one, uh, that's, that's a problem right there. But that's the kind of thing that a forensic odontologist or a forensic dentist would be called for. Here's some more information about that. The most common use of forensic odontology is going to be for identifying remains. So if they find something like that skull that's in that picture, if they were to find that, then they would be able to look at the teeth, compare with known dental records of people that maybe were missing in the area, something like that, and then they would be able to identify who that person is. There are other reasons you would call a forensic odontologist as well. That's the second bullet. So anything with teeth or jaws, bite marks, things like that. So that bite mark that's there, you can see it's photographed with a measuring device in the picture, but you could measure different parts of that bite mark, which we'll talk about in a little bit, on the body and try to figure out who it was that made that bite mark. All right, so let's look at some famous examples. Our first one is Ted Bundy, probably the most famous serial killer of the 1900s. He murdered at least 30 people. He escaped from prison twice, and he, they think, raped about 100 people, probably more. They were typically girls between the ages of 12 and 25. He would have been convicted a lot sooner if this had been, these crimes had been committed more recently because of DNA evidence, but this was all before DNA evidence came into being. So even though they knew that they had committed a lot of these crimes, there was nothing they could do about it. But finally, they were able to use a bite mark to actually get him and convict him and get him put into prison. The bottom pictures there, that is Ted Bundy. Then there is a picture of his actual teeth, which luckily were pretty mangled up. Below that in the brown is an impression that the teeth, the police took from his teeth. And you can see that they have a very distinctive pattern. And then on the right, that's the picture of the bite mark from the victim's butt cheek. And then the black markings are the overlay of his teeth that they were able to slide upward onto that diagram and they matched perfectly. So they were able to get a conviction based on that, finally. Um, next is the John Wayne Gacy case. That, in that top right corner, that's the house where he lived and where he actually buried most of his victims in the basement. That girl is just like on vacation taking a picture in front of his house, which is very weird. Um, he was a serial killer. He also was married, he had kids. Um, he was a contractor, and in his spare time, he was a clown. Like, who would hire that guy to be a clown at their kid's birthday party? That thing is so scary. Anyway, um, he had this basically secret other life where he kidnapped, raped, and murdered at least 30 young men. One of the places, at least, that he buried them was under the floorboards of his house in the basement. The reason that forensic odontology is important in this case is because there were so many different victims that they had to use the teeth and the skeletons of the victims to try to figure out how many bodies there were and who they belonged to. It was a big mess. And they think there are probably a lot more victims, but they just aren't sure. Look, you can look up John Wayne Gacy or Ted Bundy for a lot more information about them. It's kind of fascinating. All right, so a little bit about teeth. Um, the average adult has 28 teeth. By the time they're 13 years old, you can see in the diagrams here the names of them. You're not going to need to worry about that for now. 
but um, we are going to talk about the different teeth and the kind of markings that they make in a bite mark. If you have wisdom teeth, you will have a total of 32 teeth later in your life. Most people don't have wisdom teeth. They're either taken out or they never came in. Most of those teeth don't show up in a bite mark anyway, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, teeth are good evidence because the outside is enamel and it's such a hard, hard substance that it stays the same for a long period of time. There are things that it can impact it and can change your bite mark. Grinding your teeth does that. Also cavities do that. That's what a cavity is where the enamel gets worn away. So it can change, but teeth are pretty solid. All right, so if you have a body and you see some injury to it, how do you actually tell if it's a bite mark or just some other kind of abrasions? There are two main things to look for, and you can see them in both of those pictures on the bottom. Two opposing, that means going in opposite directions, U-shaped arches, and then usually at the base or in the middle of the mark, there is an empty space. Sometimes, depending on how hard the person was biting, you're getting cuts if they actually break the skin or sometimes just a bunch of bruises if they don't bite hard enough to break the skin, but they do um, make a bruise mark there. And you can see in those pictures at the bottom, some of them actually went through the skin and others of them just made a little bit of a, of a bruise mark. As I said on a previous slide, you don't always see all the teeth. Typically, you can imagine that if you're gonna bite something, your back teeth are not going to probably be in that bite mark. So the front teeth are the primary biting teeth. And so you usually get six top and six bottom teeth that will show in a bite mark. So those are the ones that we most commonly look for. Analyzing a bite mark is a difficult thing to do because there are so many other variables. Apples shown in the bottom there. That apple is going to shrink and wither and dry up and the bite mark is gonna change over time. So there are a few things that are really important to be able to do quickly after a bite mark is noticed. Um, some of these bullets there say that you take a picture pretty quickly with it, and that's what they're doing in that photo there. There is this two-sided measuring device. You take a picture with that, and then the evidence can rot all at once, but you have the photo so it works out. Um, another drawback kind of to bite marks is that because the analysis is so difficult, it's not really a great kind of evidence to use for pinpointing one individual. They have done that, but that's not really ideal because they can be sort of subjective. It's not a perfect match or a perfect answer every time. A lot of times it's used as just one piece of evidence in a case to either connect somebody or eliminate someone. It's a lot easier to eliminate someone than it is to say, yes, this is their bite mark for sure. These days, so many people have had braces that a lot of people have nice, straight aligned teeth. So you'll see in one of our steps in a minute that one of those steps is measuring and that becomes really, really important because even if we all had perfectly nice straight teeth, they're still gonna be different sizes and different um, mouth dimensions. So we'll look at that in a minute. All right, so we're gonna look at four steps in the analysis of a bite mark. Um, number one, and I put the word in red, that's kind of the key word for each step. Number one is to determine which jaw is which. So which one is made by the upper jaw and which one is made by the lower jaw. You can look at these two pictures and get some assistance there. So let's look at this one right here first. You can see here that there are, there's a mark there, there's a mark there, a littler one there, a littler one there, and then there are these other little circle-y things next on the other sides. And then on this side, there are four still kind of rectangular marks, but they're all kind of the same size. That's gonna help you to figure out upper and lower jaws. All right, so the first thing is the upper jaw is wider. So you look for the one that is widening out. So this one's way out here and out here. And here, it's a skinnier top, a skinnier section. So this would be the top jaw, and then this would be the lower jaw. The other way that you can tell 
is that your upper jaw has two wide central incisors. That's these two. Your top front teeth tend to be larger. So right here, these two middle ones are longer than the two side ones. These are the lateral incisors. That is what is telling you that this is another way to tell you that this is the top jaw. If we look at the other picture, same thing. Here's a big wide one and a wide one, and then a couple smaller marks. This one, they're more about the same size. So in this case, this would be the upper jaw and then this side over here, the lower. The second step is to figure out which teeth made which marks. So we can figure out, okay, is this person missing a tooth here or missing a tooth there? Or how does it work? So which marks are made by which teeth? Um, one of the first things that you're gonna look at are those incisors that we already talked about. Incisors make rectangular marks. So these four right here are the incisors and they make a little rectangular mark that you saw on the last ones. Something like that kind of make rectangular marks. So you get two big rectangular marks for these and then two smaller ones for those. Not the greatest artist, but you get the point. The bottom ones, see how they're all the same size, those, let, those incisors on the bottom? So down here we're getting four kind of the same size markings. So that makes a difference. The cuspids are the next teeth over. Sometimes they're called the canines, but they're the next ones over. So because they're pointed, they tend to make an oval or a round type mark left behind in a bite mark. So here they are right here, ovals or round type shapes on the sides of those. So you have the rectangles and then you'll have these ovals or round ones that are on the corners. Those are from the cuspids. So you're looking for those in a bite mark as well. Another kind of teeth that you're going to see in some bite marks, not all bite marks, are the premolars and the molars. So we already covered the incisors, and then here are the cuspids or the canines. After that, we have two premolars. These two right here are the premolars, the first premolar and the second premolar. And then behind that, we have the regular molars, first molar, second molar, third molar. Molars are teeth that have um, sort of multiple parts to them, like this. So you see that it has kind of the four corners that stick up. That is obviously gonna make a different shape in a bite mark. So you see these things right here that have all these different little sections to them. Those are indicating premolars and molars that have made marks in these bite marks. It's pretty hard to do. Imagine yourself biting someone. All right, you're getting these front teeth. To get a bite that far back, you are really uh, biting down on that. So molars are not often found but premolars sometimes are. Molars are harder to find, but you can still tell them from their shapes in the bite marks. So once you're looking at the bite mark and trying to figure out which teeth made which marks, one of the things you're looking for are damaged, missing, or short teeth. That tells you something about the bite mark of the person that you're looking for. So for example, in this diagram here, Right over here, there's a bruised area, but there's not a cut in the skin. These have cuts, and then here is just a bruise. So that's telling us that right here in this person's mouth, they probably are gonna have either a short tooth or a missing tooth, something like that, that's going to change the appearance of their bite mark and their teeth. Same thing on this side. There's really not even a lot of bruising over here. So this blank mark tells you something as well. And then this little cartoony version, you can see the teeth are kind of spread out. There's four rectangles, but over here we're missing something. So we're looking for a person who's missing a tooth in that place. This is not absolute evidence because there could also have been something in the way or they bit at an angle or things like that. So you need to be very careful about analyzing a bite mark because there are so many different variables that can affect what you're actually getting on the, on the skin or on the object. Our third step in bite mark analysis is the measuring. Get rid of that. Um, 
When you're doing the measuring, again, you, they use this two-sided measuring device that you can see in the pictures, and they photograph it. Any kind of bruises, any kind of injuries to the body, they're going to heal. So you need to make sure that you have photographs taken when everything is fresh so you can have the best amount of evidence. Um, the measuring is really, really important. Everybody can have all the same perfect teeth, but everyone's mouths are a little bit of a different size. This direction, this direction, all around, all the way around. So the measuring is really where it gets to be kind of more exact. Once you have the measurements done, the last step is to compare the two things. You have your suspect bite, I'm sorry, you have your bite mark, and then you have your suspects. So what a lot of police departments will do is use wax impressions. That's the corner in this bottom right, I'm sorry, the picture in the bottom right corner. Those are wax, and you have your suspects bite into it, and then you can compare it to the bite mark. A lot of times another method is using transparent overlays. It's like a clear piece of paper with the um, bite mark printed on it, and when you slide it up over onto the bite mark, you can see if it matches or not. So in these pictures at the bottom, you can see here. It, these yellow markings are the bite mark. And then the green highlighted parts are the actual teeth from the um, suspect. So what you wanna see is, do they match? And if you had them separate, it might look like they match, but if you slide the overlay on top of there, you can see, okay, we have a match there and that's good. And this one isn't too far off, but these definitely show that this person did not make this bite mark. All right, so the transparent overlay can be really helpful in seeing that that, that does not match. The middle one, um, this is showing that there is one that does match because if you were to slide this part backwards right over top of the bite mark, you would see that they do match up. So that's the conclusion of the analysis of a bite mark. Bite marks are useful, but they can't be used as your only evidence. So this slide is just talking about how um, at an actual meeting of people who are certified forensic odontologists, how they found that 63% of the time they made the wrong decision. So if you're ever on a jury or if you ever hear about this, make sure that you don't just take a bite mark as your only piece of evidence because there is a lot of interpretation that's going on there. You have to make sure. Bite marks are good, but they can't be your only piece of evidence. And that guy, dang. That's a problem. If somebody bit you like that, whew. All right, so that's the end of forensic odontology. I'm glad to get to teach you again, at least for a little while, and hopefully I'll see you soon. Bye.